me what's going on for you and how could I help? Um, yes, so I have a few questions, um, mainly logical reasoning focused and um, a few reading comprehension because I spent most of my time studying um, the logic games and now I just kind of wrapped up the logical reasoning part in my um, study schedule and I'm about to start the reading comprehension part. So um, I guess to start maybe um, some of the logical reasoning questions. Yeah, sure, so, shoot. Yeah, so um, I guess just a general question um, that I've been running into is, um, and I'm sure a lot of people have this problem when you're down between um, two questions or maybe it might be or two question choices and um, or maybe multiple and just how to really narrow it down and to um, at what point you know to decide which one's wrong um, does that make sense yeah totally okay. this is a very common issue down to two picking the wrong one and first mm -hmm. off I want to say that sometimes you're down to two and you pick the right one and right. so there's a certain selection effect there. You don't always pick the wrong one, which is something a lot of people raise as an issue, not necessarily you in particular, but one thing that might have come to mind. But when you're down to two, there's the strength of the language to consider. Okay. So certain types you're looking for stronger language, certain times you're looking for weaker language. Do you feel like you have a handle on when to be looking for what? Um, at times. <laughs> I think... Um... For certain question types, yes. So if I'm um, doing like a necessary assumption, then I know, okay, um, certain language, uh, wait, yeah, that's the one where it's like, um, if it's too extreme, that's not the right answer. So I kind of like can get a good gauge on that, but some are a little more ambiguous for me. Um, okay, so... Necessary assumption, as you said, extreme language, not the way to go. More moderate language is what you're looking for there. So right. that's a decision point, necessary assumption, down to two, leaning one way versus leaning the other way. Okay. And then other types, it may be, the calculus may be different. So in sufficient assumption, for example, strong language is a great way to go. It could be as strong as you want as long as it gets the job done. So you may not want something as moderate in that context. This is not a hard and fast rule. Everything depends on the specifics, but this could help you lean in one way versus leaning in the other way. Okay. So really look at the language um, type. Okay. That makes sense. And, oh, um, something that did happen when I was going over principal questions, um, for the most part, I have a good handle on them. Um, but some, I'm trying to remember the specific question, but um, uh, the answer choices for one of the ones I was looking at, they were all very similar and I realized that <laughs> I picked the wrong answer because the language was um, diff like they had it wasn't so much they made it extreme but they had changed the wording where it didn't necessarily match the question but the right answer kind of took almost verbatim and I just was looking at context over um, context over the language at that point mm -hmm. when you say context over language what do you mean um, well, it's taking more of what I thought the answer was saying um, in terms of, I'm really trying to remember what they were talking about. You mean like about. the topic? Yes, the topic. There you go. Thank you. Gotcha. <laughs> sure. So the topic never matters. Topic okay. never matters. It's the structure of the argument that matters. So oh, okay. in a parallel reasoning question or principal application, doesn't matter if the topic's the same. What matters is the substance in terms of how they go about making the argument. So the degrees of certainty and the categories of things they're discussing. Okay. Those are the okay. two things you always want to look for in principal application and parallel reasoning. The degree of certainty and the category of things they're discussing. This to me is the core. And this relates also back to your question around being down to two. A lot of times they will be, two choices will be extremely similar, but one goes astray on degree of certainty or the category degree okay. of certainty you probably have a handle on what that means like always never sometimes most of the time yes. but category of things they're discussing is a little bit different okay that would be like all people who take the lsat versus all people who take the lsat 
and also study properly. Studying okay. properly is a further constraint or limitification or qualifying factor, limiting who we're talking about. And so you want to see how closely does it need to match. And then okay. you have incorrect answers that would limit it in some way that don't really matter or are relevant. Like all people who take the LSAT and are also vegetarian. That would be, vegetarian would be an irrelevant factor in that example potentially, but still limiting it in a way that doesn't matter. Okay, that makes sense. Okay, that, that actually clears up a lot because I feel like I have been getting, um, I guess, a little sidetracked with the topic and getting bogged down by those details. Um, and that's like something I was vaguely aware of, but I wasn't really sure where my mistake was coming from. So that makes sense. Awesome. Thank you. Of course, glad to help. Um, I'm trying to look at my other questions. Sorry, I wrote like a list. Yeah, <laughs> so I'm just scanning right through. <laughs> um, oh, okay. Uh, part of, um, can you, would you be able to go over just negating conditional statements? Because I feel like I've read your articles, I watched your video, but putting it into practice, it's still like a disconnect for me. I mean, I feel like it's something simple that I'm just maybe overcomplicating. Yeah, totally. It's a confusing issue that comes up a lot. It actually is fairly straightforward to address it, but we could certainly talk through it. And the issue okay. is that when we put things in if then, mm -hmm. it becomes hard to know what do we convert from positive to negative. Right. So like X negated is not X. Y can negate it is not Y. But if X then Y, we're like, are we negating the X? Are we negating the Y? Hard to say. And so I would say translate it okay. away from being an if then conditional. Okay. So we could say instead of if X, then Y, we could say X requires Y. Okay, that makes sense. Okay. So then if we have X requires Y, the negation would be to negate the verb itself. So how might you go about that? Any ideas? Um, okay, negate the verb itself. Did you want it just negate? Would you just go ahead and negate? You're not going to negate Y. You're going to say X does not require Y. Well, you got yeah, it. then you would be negating you got Y. Yeah. No, you got it. You're perfect. And I put you on the spot and you still got it, which is awesome. And I, <laughs> and I don't like to do that unless I think you can do it, but I knew you could. So <laughs> Thank you. you're good, of course. So X requires Y becomes X does not require Y. We negate okay. the verb. That is the way to get the logical opposite of that statement. Okay. Okay. That makes sense. Cool. cool. Then, so it really can be as simple as that. So if you were drawing it out, you have X arrow Y, you're putting a slash through the arrow. That's how I would mm. illustrate that or diagram it, even though this doesn't really come up in logic games. This is more of a logical reasoning thing. Yeah. They're also that makes never, sense. yeah, cool. And they're also never asking you to negate something, but this could come up in, for example, necessary assumption questions if you're mm -hmm. trying to negate all five choices. Okay. That actually helps a lot. <laughs> yeah. Big part. I don't know why it's a necessary assumption and the sufficient assumption that just throws me off for some reason. Um, and I find that not so much I mix them up, but they're both like equally the harder ones for me. Yeah. They're a common issue but first of all just simply telling the difference mm -hmm. and then knowing how to approach each because they are common they are difficult and they're completely different in terms of approach right okay um so going on oh i do have a qu another question um with logical reasoning so going through some of your videos i um note one of the strategies you talk about is um, diagramming certain logical reasoning questions, but not all of them. And I guess my question is just when would that be necessary? And is that something that you should do if, like, say you run into a hard problem, but you're running out of time and diagramming would help you solve it? Should you go ahead and diagram that? Should you skip it? Or <laughs> yeah. tips, different tips on that. Great question. So Diagramming, I think most students tend to, di tend to diagram far too much. Mm 
Okay. I would diagram very little in logical reasoning, only on certain specific question types. Okay. So those types would be sufficient assumption a lot of the time, okay. parallel reasoning sometimes, and must be true questions and other inference questions sometimes. That's it. Logical reasoning is much more informal logic where you are really engaging with the arguments in a real world sense. But for certain particular types that are more formal logic style in nature, it could be useful. But diagramming is not a substitute for thinking or for engaging with the argument. And there are really, like I said, very limited cases where it's useful. And that's where it's more technically worded, the way that a normal person would never talk. Lots of conditionals are a good indicator that you might want to go in that direction. And then you'll see, of course, in the course, I've got the formulas for sufficient mm -hmm. assumption questions. So that's a unique category where diagramming is often a valuable technique. But I wouldn't resort to it all the time. Okay. That, that's good to know. Okay, perfect. Because I was, I don't normally diagram, so I was like, ooh, should I be doing that more? But um, good to know the three types so that I'll try practicing that when I run into that issue. Yeah, of course. And if you're saying, like, I don't diagram much, should I diagram more? The answer is probably not. Okay. Typically, people diagram too much, and I have to move them away from that because okay. some other companies out there, they'll suggest diagramming all the time. And I come across students who are trying to diagram a necessary assumption question where that's not really useful at all. They're just essentially summarizing all the proper nouns in the stimulus with letters, but that's not oh. really getting you anywhere. It gets you somewhere when you're taking the contrapositive or linking things together. If you're not okay. doing that, it's probably not going to help you. Okay. That, that's good to know. <laughs> Great. Then I'll keep doing what I'm doing, but look for opportunities to diagram, I think. Awesome. Cool. Anything else for today? Um, yes, if we still have yeah, time, sure, I guess totally. just my last one would be um, starting the reading comprehension section. Um, that's an area that I've never really known how to study. And I just, um, and you cover this in like your introduction video about, you know, how everyone can improve, but I'm just trying to figure out what your different tips on are for improving besides maybe increasing your um, pacing. Yeah, sure. I don't want to talk in too many general terms just because you've already got that mm -hmm. in the course. Right. But doing actual passages and extracting okay. the main idea as an exercise. If you're just looking to get started, can you read a passage and walk away simply with the main idea? Okay. People talk about reading external sources like the Scientific American, The Economist, and all that. Mm -hmm. And that's a nice thing to do, but you've got nearly 400 reading comp passages available to you. I would, I would focus on those if you can. Okay. I would say you could read those magazines on your commute, but very few people are commuting these days. So you might as well just use the actual LSAT exams. <laughs> yeah, my commute's to my door, so. <laughs> yeah, exactly. <laughs> okay, that's a great, I've never actually considered just reading the passage on itself and looking for the main point. So that's a really good tip. Thank you. Yeah, of course. Awesome, um, Jen. Well, yeah. <laughs> I'm glad we connected. What would you say is the Same. biggest insight you got from our call today? Oh my goodness, so many things. I think probably for me, um, just the whole narrow, how to narrow down um, your answer choices and really not to get bogged into um, the topic of the question as you were talking about. And um, the second thing would probably be uh, your little tip about diagramming because that gave me peace that I don't really have to go through and diagram more. Um, but everything you said was very helpful and I'm definitely taking it all away. So thank you. Of course. Glad to help, Jen. Keep in touch and I'll see you in class soon. Sounds good. Thank you. Have a great day. Thanks for tuning into the show. Please subscribe if you haven't done so already to be notified of new episodes as I release them. And feel free to reach out if you need anything at all as you move forward with your prep. I'm happy to help however I can. In the meantime, I wish you all the best and take care.